All right. So the, the part of the chapter we're going to focus on tonight is actually, it, it's extremely profound, and it's only two words there in verse 16. Rejoice evermore. I love this great list. You have all kinds of things that at the very end of this epistle to the Thessalonians, Apostle Paul is just laying out all these various things, and each one of these is a sermon in and of itself. Each one of these concepts of, of you know, pray without ceasing, rejoice evermore, everything give thanks, quench not the spirit. There's so much truth just packed into this small little section of Scripture, and we're going to be focusing on one of those, and that's rejoice evermore. Now, I, I like to give you a balanced diet here at Word of Truth Baptist Church. You know, we get pretty heavy on all the preaching on sin and all the, the hard preaching and stuff like that. But, you know, we need to balance this off with, with, with some of the good stuff, you know, some of the positive. There's a lot positive in the Bible. There's a lot negative in the Bible. We need to hear it all. We need, we need to hear the whole counsel of God. So tonight... The, the, those of you that are here, you're in for, for a treat. I'm not going to be ripping your face off or anything like, like we do some other times. We're going to be talking about rejoicing evermore. Now, just so you don't get too comfortable, this is a commandment. Okay, rejoice evermore. Now, it's a great commandment. I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, someone tells you, be happy, rejoice. You know, be, be ha having a joyous attitude, a joyous life. These are good things. This is something that we definitely... Um, but uh, it's a good for us, but we need to be reminded of it from time to time. You know, it's easy to get caught up in the battle and to get caught up in the fight and to get caught up in, in even just monitoring our own lives and, and trying to, to be real diligent about not sinning and, you know, and, and all these different stresses that, that can add up. We need to remember, we need to rejoice too. There's a lot of things to be thankful for. And what I'm going to do tonight with this sermon, this is kind of a shorter sermon tonight, where I, I'm not going to belabor the point anymore than, than we need to, to cover. But we're going to look at just some, some scripture and just biblical reasons for us to be rejoicing and biblical things to be happy about and things that we, we need to be mindful of and not forgetting. Um, you don't have to turn there. Turn if you would to... Leviticus chapter 23. We'll get to that in a few minutes. In Philippians chapter 3, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. And, and you'll find throughout the book of Philippians, there's multiple references to, to telling the people to rejoice. He's saying, look, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And then in chapter 4, verse 4, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. This is something that's found actually many times. And, and you might not have really picked it up a whole lot, but I, I love doing word studies in the Bible. I, I love finding something and just, just seeing and where's all the places this shows up. And that's one of the way, one of my main ways for kind of preparing sermon. I just, I love doing the word studies. I love finding them out. And um, little things like that, consider them little. It's, this isn't a little thing. A lot of people, I think, skip over this, but just the concept of rejoicing and, and being joyful and having joy in your heart is found all throughout the Bible. This is actually, uh, uh, there's a lot of scripture on this, but a lot of it's relatively redundant, but you get that because we need to hear it over and over. Look, you, right. we need to be rejoicing. There's definitely a time and place to be sober. You know, we ought to be sober in our lives and be serious about things. But you can be sober and have a get good attitude and still rejoice in, in, in all the goodness that God has given us. God, this is a commandment to rejoice. And the more you read your Bible, the, hopefully the more godly your life will become, the more you start to put into practice the things that you find written in God's Word and you start getting sin out of your life. But the more you actually follow God's Word, the more persecutions you're going to end up facing. The, the more you're sanctifying yourself and the more holy you're trying to live and actually follow and doing not just, not even just with the sin, but doing the, the, you know, there's sins of commission and sins of omission. You start getting rid of the sins of commission, the, the sins that, that, you know, God said, don't do this, and you do it, you know, not to fornicate, not to lie, not to drink, not, you know, all these different things. And you get rid of those things, but then you also start doing, you know, the, to preach the gospel to every creature and go and, and, and pray without ceasing, do all these various things uh, that the Bible says that we ought to be doing. That's when you're going to end up finding some, oftentimes, more problems. And unfortunately, a lot of people get this backwards and they think that, you know, they, they gauge their life off of circumstances that are happening around them. And if you're going through a hard time, you just automatically assume, well, I must be doing something wrong. 
And that's not always the case. Sometimes that happens. But oftentimes you could be doing exactly what's right and bad things will start happening to you. And man, I've seen it so many times. You get someone, a new believer, someone who's just excited. They come in, they get baptized, they start learning, they start growing, and they really start doing good. And what happens? They face a lot of persecution. Family finds out you're going to a Baptist church? Wait, what is that, a cult? What do you mean? You go out and knock on doors? Wait, what do you, you know, what are all these rules that you're, that you're following now? What do you mean you don't go out to the bar? What do you mean? You, you know, and, and people flip out over it. The unsaved family just, you know, will, will send forth the persecution. And unfortunately, sometimes that, that's too much for certain people to handle. And they, they kind of get out of church and they stop, they stop their growth in the Lord. But my point is that when you start doing good, the persecutions will come. The Bible says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The persecutions happen, especially the more godly you live. There was no one more godly on the face of this earth than Jesus Christ our Lord, and they sought to kill him, and they nailed him to a tree. This is the result of, of you know, living that perfect life. That's what the world rejects it. So we need to be prepared for that. But as we go through this stuff, as we go through the emotional struggles and the persecutions and the turmoils, we still need to be able to rejoice. And there's a lot of comfort in this. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 1.18, For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. The more you learn, the more you understand, you can, you can gain, you know, have sorrow. And look, it's not, it, there's nothing wrong with being sorrowful. So just, just to get the proper balance and within the sermon, the Bible says rejoice evermore, but it doesn't mean that there's something wrong if you're not just happy every single second of your life. Okay, what's being taught here is that there's definitely times to rejoice. We, we need to be able to continue to rejoice in the goodness of God, but there's nothing wrong with grieving. There's nothing wrong with sorrowing. There's nothing wrong, especially when bad things happen. I mean, Jesus Christ himself wept at the tomb of Lazarus when he saw the grief and, and, and the impact on everyone else and how they loved him and, and everything else. I mean, he was sorrowing. Jesus Christ was a man of sorrows, the Bible tells us. About someone who had more wisdom and knowledge and grief. Jesus Christ, there's nothing wrong with that, but we ought not to get swallowed up with it. And that is definitely something to, to be on guard for, because there's a lot of horrible things that happen in this life. There's a lot of reasons for people, legitimate reasons to be sad and sorrowful, but we don't want to let that just bring us down and kind of like I was saying this morning, get us out of the fight. You know, and just, and just be overwhelmed with this sorrow. God wants us to maintain the proper perspective so that we don't faint, so that we don't just stop doing what we're supposed to be doing. And um, what's interesting about rejoicing, I do turn to Leviticus 23, is that it is a commandment. Now, we saw in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, rejoice evermore, which the statement itself is a command. But we see this not only commanded in the New Testament, but it's a part of God's law to rejoice. Look at Leviticus 23, verse number 39. Verse number 39, the Bible reads, Also in the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered in the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. And ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. See, and people are always trying to peg the God of the Old Testament as some mean God, and here he's commanding you to rejoice. It's a good thing, right? Verse 41, And ye shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. Ye shall celebrate it in the seventh month. God likes for us to have celebrations and to have these times of rejoicing. And he put aside these times. I mean, hey, we serve a God that commanded you not to work for an entire day, right? I mean, praise God for that. Now, uh, you know, we're not, we're not Seventh-day Adventists or anything, but, but God had it as part of his law. He's saying, look, you work your six days as he did, but then take a time out to rest. I mean, take care of yourself. It's good for you. All of God's commandments, all of God's laws are all for our own benefit. Right. I mean, everything that he did is, is because he has the knowledge and the wisdom from creating us of what is good for us. It is good to have the rejoicing and it's good to have that day of rest. And it's good to have these celebrations. And you know who deserves it? 
the Lord deserves it more than anything. He created these feasts, and he's, you know, where the whole point was to give honor and respect and rejoice in the Lord. And, uh, and he set apart these times to do it. And who doesn't like having a good celebration anyways? It's nice that God has instituted that, at least in the Old Testament, as part of, part of his laws. Um, you don't have to turn there. I'm going to read essentially the same things reiterated in Deuteronomy chapter 12. Uh, verse number five, but unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither thou shalt come. And thither ye shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and heave offerings of your hand and your vows and your freewill offerings and the first things of your herds and of your flocks, and there ye shall eat before the Lord your God. And see, this is how you know that the Baptist has a true religion. Or there shall you eat before you... <laughs> what Baptist church doesn't have a good... We just had a good meal after church this morning. Anyways, uh, it wouldn't be a Baptist church if you couldn't at least throw in a food joke, right? And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice in all that you put your hand unto, ye and your households, wherein the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Again, there's a commandment. You shall rejoice. You know, I want you to go here. You're going to eat some food. You're going to rejoice and, you, and, and celebrate... And, and take the time to, to, you know, I mean, if nothing else, blow off some steam. You know, get, get yourself grounded and in, in, um, your mind in, in the right place. <clears throat> now, one way that we ought to be rejoicing is in our songs, in singing. It's a way to express that joy. And when we rejoice to, to the Lord, one of the ways that we do that is through song. Now, I don't know about you, but when I grew up, I grew up in a Presbyterian church, and I didn't get saved until much later. I left the church when I was like 20 years old is when, is when I finally got saved. But I never liked to sing. And now I'm up here leading the scene. I've always loved music. Problem is I love the world's music and everything else, but I still love music. Music is great. M you know, music to my ears. I love it. But I hated singing. So whenever we'd go to church, you know, parents made us go to church every week, so I would just, time for singing, I would just look at the book. Just, just look at the words. Sometimes, if I felt uncomfortable, I might mouth the words, so it, so it looked like I was singing. Well, this habit continued, you know, even after I got saved and I got into church, I was, a, I was you know, and look, for people, nobody here, nobody here, except my wife's known me the longest, but no one here even knew me, like, when I was really really shy and um, doing something like this was was would have been a shock to my system I would have said no way will I ever be standing in front of a group of people even if it's a small group of people saying anything because it physically made me ill but um, you know praise God for 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 changing us and, and allowing us to do things through his power but I was of the you know after I started going to a good church you know got baptized or get right with God I still don't really like singing that much. But you see over and over again, and I, and I didn't even make the sermon about this at all, but you want to talk about a commandment? Praise God. Praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. Look at how many times the Bible says to praise God and to give, sing praises to his name and to praise him. Just read through the book of Psalms and you'll see over and over and over and over and over again in the songbook. And you know what? It's not a coincidence that the longest book in the Bible is a songbook. God wants to hear our praise. God loves to hear our praise. Don't ever think that, you, that because you think you can't sing well, that God still doesn't want to hear you sing. I've always been self-conscious of my voice and things like that, but it wasn't until I kind of understood that truth that I started singing out and just singing out just loudly and, and with a good heart to, to God to just sing praise unto His name because... When you realize, and, and you understand this even more as a parent, I love to hear my children singing songs. I love when I'm at home and they're singing Nothing But the Blood, or they're singing Amazing Grace, or they're singing whatever their favorite song is at the time. And can they carry a tune? Not really. Do they hit the notes right? No. Sometimes it's not even the right melody, you know, whatever. But it's a beautiful sound. I love to hear them singing those songs. It, 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 it's music to my ears. Even if it's not the, the, the most, you know, the fancy or the best presentation like a professional would do, it's great. And, and as children of God, I know that God up in heaven wants to hear his children singing praises unto him 
from their heart. Because when my children sing, it's from their heart. I mean, they, they're singing because they want to sing because they, they love the songs or whatever. And that's the way that we ought to be rejoicing and praising God. So, you know, and we don't have this problem at this church, thank God, but, but I've been in other churches where, like, I visited and, and no one's really singing. I mean, it's like really, really quiet. And there's a problem there. We ought to be rejoicing unto God and say, you know what, I don't care if I'm not the best or singer. And you all here know that, <laughs> that I don't care if I'm not the best singer because I'm leading the music and you've already sat through it. But it, it's, it's, it's great. It, you know, we praise unto God. Psalm 33, I'll just read this for you. Verse 1, Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise the Lord with harp. Sing unto him with a psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. The only thing we're missing here is any type of musical accompaniment. We don't have anyone on the piano yet, but, um, but God loves to hear the same. We ought to be praising and rejoicing in the Lord when we sing these songs unto him. So when, you, when it comes time for the singing, don't just, don't just mouth the words. You know, get, get involved. Sing. Get your heart right with God. Don't worry about the people around you. Just think about God and, and sing these prayers. I mean, these, these hymns are awesome. They are full of great doctrine and, and, and teaching and giving praise. You know, and if you notice this evening, you probably didn't pay that much attention, but all the songs we're singing are all joyful song, right? songs, right? Oh, say, but I'm glad. And uh, what else are we saying? There shall be showers of blessing. Praise him, praise him. Jesus, our blessed redeemer. So many reasons to sing praises unto God. And so many reasons to rejoice. We started with rejoice evermore. From 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So many reasons to rejoice. Of course, the number one primary reason that, that any born-again believer can rejoice is our own salvation. Amen. That God loves us. He had mercy on us and saved us from our sins and, and gave us that free gift of eternal life that we cannot screw up. We cannot lose it or get rid of it. Once He's given it to us, we are saved forever. God has showed us and granted us extreme mercy. That is a great reason to rejoice. Amen. But there's so much more than just, I mean, that alone is enough. I mean, we could just stop right there and be like, there is all the reasons right there to rejoice in God and just to be happy from a day-to-day -day basis that, thank God, I, uh, I've done so many things, God, and, and I know what I deserve. But I am so thankful for you for saving my, my soul. And, and I could rejoice in knowing what's ahead. That's awesome. And I don't want to understate that either. I think everyone knows that here, but, but I don't want to understate that. But I have a lot more things that I think oftentimes gets forgotten as well. Um, do I, did I have you turn anywhere? Or no? Did I, no. Just kind of sitting around? Are you in, uh, what book do I got you in? Leviticus. Okay, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 26. You're right over there. Deuteronomy 26. <sighs> We need to take a step back and rejoice in all of the good things that God has given us and done for us. We have a tendency to, to be focusing, just in part of our sinful human nature, to be focusing on things that we don't have as opposed to the things that we do have. And your attitude can really change a lot just by, by read centering what you're what you think about if it's things that you don't have or it's things that you do have uh we need to rejoice for all of the good things that god has given you look at verse 11 of deuteronomy 26 verse number 11 the bible reads and thou shalt rejoice in every good thing which the lord thy god hath given unto thee and unto thine house thou and the levite and the stranger that is among you say so rejoice every good thing that god has done for you the bible says yeah every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It comes out from the Father of lights. God gives us all of the good things in our life. We need to recognize that and appreciate that. And we need to, to keep the proper perspective on being happy for what we have and not complaining over what we don't have and just being... And, you know, plenty of examples in the Bible about that. You, re, you look at the children of Israel being, you know, walking, walking around in the wilderness of sin and, uh, you know, when they start complaining, oh, we remember what we had in Egypt... It's convenient how they forget about the bondage and the slavery and the, you know, the hard work and, and the, the toil and the turmoil and everything else that was going wrong for them when now they're out in the woods and they're, and they're saying, you know, 
oh, we remember the garlic and the spices and the fish, and you know, now all we got is this manna that is a miracle from God to begin with that they had, which to me it sounds pretty good anyways. You know, it was a wafer, it tasted kind of like honey and had a sweet flavor to it, and they didn't even have to work for it, just gather it up and eat it. God took care of them and they started what they started focusing on what they didn't have instead of focusing on what they did. They would have a much better attitude if they said, wow, hey, God, thank you for providing food for me again today. That I could wake up, I could go outside, and there's food like right outside of my doorstep that I could just pick up off the ground and satisfy my needs. Praise God for that. I mean, that, that's such a better, you know, the, the attitude that God wants us to have. And that's the rejoicing attitude, the, the rejoicing in what we have and every good thing that God has done for us instead of turning into these spoiled brat children of God just, just so sick of everything that you already have and wanting more, 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 more. It's a covetous attitude we need to watch out for. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter number 5. Proverbs chapter number 5. I'm going to read for you from Psalm 5. Another reason we have to rejoice is that we have a God that is so big and able to protect us and, and, and keep us from harm and from evil and we don't have anything to fear. It's a great reason to be happy when you've got nothing to fear. Amen. Psalm 5.11 says, But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. When you've got nothing to fear, you've got lots of reasons to rejoice. And when you've got God as our Savior and God uh, to, to look out for you, then um, you've got nothing to worry about because God will fight your battles for you. And anything that does happen, it's because God allows it. If you're walking in His ways and you're, and you're looking to Him in all that you do. Proverbs chapter number 5. Proverbs chapter 5 is where I had you turn. Proverbs 5, look at verse number 18. So we need to rejoice in all the good things that God has given unto us. We need to rejoice because God is our defender. God is our de uh, protector. God is the one we'll be looking out for us. We can trust and rely on Him and, and be safe in the arms of our, of our, of our loving God to, to fight our battles for us. Proverbs 5, look at verse number 18. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. If you're married today, rejoice with, for your wife. It is a blessing. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? There's really so many things. If we could follow this one simple command of, of being happy and rejoicing in what we have, it'll keep us from so many other bad things and horrible sins that we shouldn't get involved with at all. In this case, when you're rejoicing in your wife and being thankful and, and happy that your wife is there and she's your wife, then it's going to keep you from adultery. It's going to keep you from going to the strange woman because you're happy with your own wife. You're just rejoicing in the fact that God has given you a godly wife. When you're happy with what God has given you, with the food you have, then it's going to keep you from being covetous against the things that you don't have. You can see this is, this is the positive aspect of refraining from doing those negative types of sins. By, by doing these things. You know, the Bible says you walk in the Spirit and you should not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. It's that type of mentality, that type of attitude where instead of focusing on all the negative things, you just focus on what I should be doing. You keep yourself busy doing everything that's right, you're not going to have any time to do what's wrong. You have your, your mind focused on, on rejoicing in the things that the Lord has given you and being happy with that, then you're not going to go after the things you don't have and the sinful things, the, the, the adulterous or the, you know, the, what, whatever the case may be. Turn if you would to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. You may have noticed during the announcement times that we keep track of, of our soul winning efforts. We, uh, you know, I've heard people criticize that and, and, and all kinds of different reasons for it, but I'll tell you why we do it. There's, there's a few reasons why we, we keep track of the souls that are saved through the efforts of this church. 
One is because it's our primary focus in this church is to go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is our focus. I mean, if you want to know what our church is about, our church is about soul winning. Our church is about going out and preaching the gospel to the lost and, and trying to fulfill that great commission. So it's a center focus. And the other reason is that it's, it's you know, we have a goal because we're trying to push ourselves to do more. We have a goal of how many people. So we have this number. Right, and this year it's 160 people is, we're, is our goal to try to, to win to Christ. But the reason why I think it's great and not something that's bad or, 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 or anything like that is because each one of these numbers represents an individual, a soul that, that we spent the time to go out and talk to and show them and share the gospel of Jesus Christ and they confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and, and to the best of our knowledge, they believe in their heart that God hath raised them from the dead. I mean, without being able to have a magnifying glass to see through to their heart, you know, we're going based off the confession that they make, but we do a very thorough job of trying to present the gospel to them and, and this is what our job is. This is what we're supposed to be doing. And the Bible says that we ought to be rejoicing in souls that get saved and people that put their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. We started off saying that, hey, we ought to be rejoicing in the fact that we're saved. You know, thank God for his, for his abundant mercy and his grace and, and giving us that gift of eternal life. Well, hey, thank God for giving it to our neighbor too. Thank God to give it to everyone else. John 4, look at verse number 35. Jesus Christ said, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. Look at this. That both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. There is rejoicing between the laborers that go out and sow the word of God and water the word of God and plow that ground and reap and go out and, and make that harvest. There is rejoicing together between all the laborers for those souls that end up being reaped and being, and being um, saved. Other things that we ought to rejoice over. Now, this is where you're going to realize you're, you're, in, you're in Word of Truth Baptist Church because there are some other things that don't get caught. And this is a great topic, and I love it, and I love rejoicing, but you're probably not going to hear this very many places. We're going to start off a little bit easier. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, reasons to rejoice. We started off, we got a lot of, I would consider them obvious reasons to rejoice. Obvious things that we should be happy about and that should cause us to rejoice and praise God. Obvious things, your wife. Obvious things, your salvation. Obvious things, other people's salvation. To me, these seem relatively odd. It, does, it doesn't take very much convincing to be told that, hey, rejoice when good things happen. You rejoice when, when all of your sins have just been completely pardoned and paid for by somebody else. That's a good reason to rejoice. It, does, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that. That, that's a good thing to be rejoicing over. Matthew chapter 5, look at verse 11, though. This one is going to take a little bit more to, uh, uh, teaching, probably, to understand uh, why we should be rejoicing when bad things happen to us. Verse number 11. Blessed are ye, blessed are ye, when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. How is that a blessing? People are talking bad about me. People are reviling me. I'm facing persecution. Why am I blessed for that? Why, why should I feel good about that? People are lying about me. I mean, they're just making stuff up. They're saying things falsely about me for Jesus' sake. Verse number 12, rejoice. So when that happens, he says, rejoice. Be happy about that and be exceeding glad. Why? For great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you this is one of those not so obvious reasons to rejoice you go through that type of stuff and and it doesn't feel good you're not you're not feeling very happy it's not something that that is pleasant to experience when people are lying about you dragging your name through the mud and just saying all kind of evil against you falsely because of your stand, because of your belief, because of your faith in Jesus Christ. But Jesus is saying, you know what? You should be happy. 
Why? It's because of the things that are not seen. And we, we read this this morning, um, you know, the temporal versus the eternal. And having that faith and having that sight of knowing, you know what? We're here for a short period of time. We know that this is par for the course. You know your Bible at all. As I mentioned earlier, you know, Jesus Christ, there wasn't a more righteous man than him on the earth. And look what they did to him. They arrested him. They lied about him. They bear false witness. They beat him up. They whipped him. They mocked him. They scourged him and nailed him to the cross. You can't get doing any better than he did, yet he faced that. But you know what? He's got a name above every other name. The name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Every, you know, that, he receives all the credit and all the accolades. And as Christians, as believers, hey, you got you a ticket into heaven because Jesus Christ paid for your way into heaven. But... Don't let your life stop there. We ought to be doing work for God because one of the reasons, one of the many reasons, is that you could earn rewards for yourself. And when you go through the hard times and when you go through this stuff, you know, we don't need to worry about taking vengeance, and we're going to get to that in just a minute, because God is there to be the revenger. God sees everything that happens, and he says, you know what, when you're going through this stuff, you're doing what I told you to do. You're doing the job and the tasks that I laid forward to you, and someone comes and persecutes you and ridicules you and lies about you. Don't worry about it because you know what? I got you covered and he's going to pay you and give you rewards essentially in heaven based on your diligence, your obedience, and not fainting and not letting that get you out of the fight and getting you out of the Christian race. Amen. So there is a good reason to rejoice about that when we have the proper perspective, when we could realize and, and walk by faith and not by sight and, and not get caught up in, in everything going on around us physically in this life, but know that, you know what? I'm doing what's right. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna back down. People, you know, the, the persecution's gonna come, let it come. And Jesus Christ already promised. He says, hey, rejoice. <laughs> let that let that be glad. Because the more people lie about you, the 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 more rewards you're gonna have in heaven. And it's 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 funny because it is against our nature, our fleshly nature. We, uh, we post all the sermons up on YouTube and stuff and on Facebook and, you know, you get all the comments on there. And, and at first, you know, at first start putting it up, you feel like you got to answer everybody, right? Like someone makes a comment, someone's arguing with you, someone, you know, disagrees with you, you, just, you need to answer everybody. Someone lies about you, you want to set the record straight, you don't got to worry about that. It didn't take me too long to figure it out. Just say, you know what, forget about it. Now I'm to the point where it's just like, great, you got people lying about me all the time saying that, you know, Pastor Burson preaches a work salvation, like nothing of the sort. And if anyone who's, who listens for any length of time realizes that we are so far removed from a works-based salvation, it's, it's comical that someone would even make that accusation. But there, I mean, there's all kinds of accusations out there. And now I just rejoice over it. I don't, I don't feel the need at all to have to respond. And say, okay, well, thanks. Thanks for giving me just that little bit more. Persecute me some more because I know that I'm doing the work of the Lord. Another reason to rejoice, uh, turn if you would to the book of Psalms, Psalm 19. Psalm 19. Again, not one of the, the more obvious reasons to rejoice. But a reason, nonetheless, a biblical reason, nonetheless, and that's why I said we're, we're, we're finding all these examples that are straight out of Scripture. We're, you know, being reviled. Jesus Christ said, rejoice. We could rejoice in God's law, the commandments. That is something to be happy about. That is actually a good thing. A lot of people look at it and say, oh, what do you mean the commandments? The commandments make me a sinner. That's not a good thing. Well, God's law is good. Just because you're the one that disobeys the law and becomes a sinner doesn't mean that God's law isn't good. God's law is actually a great thing. Psalm 19, verse number 7, the Bible reads, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The statutes of the Lord, if we're right with God, ought to be a rejoicing to us, to our heart. It's, it's a good thing. I, I'm glad that God has given us instruction. He's given us the right way. He says, this is what you need to be doing. This is what you shouldn't be doing. So it's not just left up to ourselves to figure it all out. He says, here it is. Do this and don't do that. Thank God for that. Thank God that he loves us enough to tell us. You don't always have to understand why 
God has instituted certain laws. Just the same way my children don't have to understand the rules that we have for them. All they have to do is trust that mom and dad love me. And because they care about me, they have instituted these rules for me to follow. I don't get why. I know I didn't understand it. I, I, just, I just brought this up to, to my boss. At, well, I have another job. I work, I work a full-time job outside of pastoring a church. And I just brought this up to my boss. How, um, and I've mentioned this in a sermon recently also. When I was younger, I was in like junior high. And I told you I was all in the world of music and stuff. I wanted to go to a Metallica concert. And all my friends were going, and they were all going, and it was just fine, and there were no parents going. And I said, Mom, let me, let me go to this concert. I want to go. This is like, you know, because I lived for music. I was like, I got to go to this. Everyone's going to it. And they said, no. And I'm thinking in my, in my you know, 12 or 13-year-old mind, what do you mean? Nothing's going to happen. It's a Metallica concert, and I'm 13 years old going with my friends. What can you possibly think is going to go wrong? <laughs> I can't even say it without laughing because, <laughs> but this is where I was. That's, I mean, in my mind, it just, it made perfect sense and they were tyrants and, and I cannot believe that you won't let me do this. I thank God that my parents didn't let me just go off and do that. I thank God that they loved me enough, no matter what type of hissy fit I threw in, in tantrum or whatever it was that I did, because I was so upset over them not letting me do that. I thank God that they loved me enough, even though I didn't understand it and didn't get it at the time, that they loved me enough to say, no, no, we're not going to let you do that. This is the type of, you know, when you could get mature enough, you should be able to rejoice that God has done that for us. And you could look at his laws and say, I don't, even, I don't even always understand this. But I know that it's in my best interest to, to follow what God has for me. He knows what's right way more than I do. And I'm not going to judge God's laws as being wrong or perverse or, or out of the way or not right. Which unfortunately these days a lot of people are doing. And it's, it's actually kind of disturbing. And, you know, I wasn't even planning on going there, but, you know, I feel like I got to say something because the, the, the culture today with the homosexuality and the sodomite crowd and the sodomite agenda has been to, to get this ever-growing sympathy and tolerance and even acceptance of the filthy wickedness that they commit. And, 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 it's, and it's just been eating away, even at Christian churches, to the point to where, you know, and, and look, I'm guilty as charged. I believe that the law of the Lord is perfect. And I believe that even though we are not in observance of the, the laws that God gave in the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, even though it's not part of our you know, a uh, uh, structure in this country or in, you know, in any nation for that matter. I still believe that the judgments that God has given for the various crimes listed in the Bible are just and righteous and they're just as just and righteous today as they ever have been. Now they have only been applied to the physical nation of Israel during that time. I get that. That is where they had been enforced. But it came from God. The judgments came from God. And what we have to see, I expect the atheists to mock and to ridicule when you call yourself a Christian. You say, I believe the Bible. You say, oh, you believe that book that says that uh, a child that smites his mother or his father should be put to death? Yeah, you know what? I do believe that. I do believe this book. And you know, I think God's judgment is more righteous than your judgment. And if he says that that is righteous and just for that to be the penalty, then who am I to judge God? Do you believe that adulterers, that the righteous judgment according to God is the death penalty? Yes, I do. And I'm not going to back down from that because God said it. And the law of the Lord is perfect. I'm not going to make an excuse for it. I'm not going to accept something else. I'm not going to say, oh, well, where's your love and compassion and forgiveness? Where's God's love and compassion and forgiveness when he instituted these laws? They're just as righteous now as they ever have been. I'm not talking about a soul's salvation. I'm talking about a crime that's committed and the just recompense according to the Bible that ought to be enforced. 
And people flip out these days because I make the stand that sodomy ought to be against the law as it once was in this country and sodomy ought to have the punishment of the death penalty associated with it because that's what God put as the punishment. He never changed that. That's always been the way that he has dictated is the punishment for the crime. And you know what? That's the way that it used to be in this country also. Most in the, in the colonies before, you know, before the, the Union, but still, the, in, in the, look it up for yourself. I've done the research on this personally, and I know this for a fact, that, that in this country, in this continent, that the, the sin, the crime of sodomy was punishable by the death penalty. Now, does that mean it was always enforced? No, but it was on the books as being a, a law, and, 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 and that was the, the punishment for it. I have no reason to believe necessarily that the children of Israel enforced all of the laws of God all the time. I doubt they did. But they're, they're God's laws nonetheless. And the law of the Lord is perfect. And we ought to rejoice in God's law. And, 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 and He knows what's right. He knows what's good. He knows what's just. And the last place on that note, turn to Psalm 58. And this is where everything's really going to come unglued for you. Psalm 58. If I didn't get you upset over that last one. Psalm 58. Again, biblical reasons to rejoice. And we have so many reasons to rejoice and be happy to God. But these last few, you know, rejoicing when people persecute you, it's not, that's not common. It kind of goes against what you might be thinking. But it's what the Bible says, and you know what? We ought to look at it with, from the proper perspective. The law of God, God's perfect law. We should rejoice in that. Just because the world doesn't rejoice in that, just because it's rejected by so many people and it, and it sounds harsh or whatever, people look, I think it's great, and I, and I thank God that he's given us those laws and that he knows what justice is. And I'm going to go with what he has dictated here. And then Psalm 58, look at verse number 3. Now, I'm going to make this mention. We, we just finished recently an entire Bible study going through the book of Proverbs. And I'm going to make this mention as we get started reading Psalm 58 when the Bible talks about the, there's a, you know, the wicked. The wicked. Now, you have to judge it on its context, obviously, as with every passage that you read in the Bible. But typically, especially in the book of Psalms and Proverbs, when we're talking about the wicked... This is talking about, ex I mean, extremely wicked people. Like in the book of Proverbs, it talked about people who they can't sleep unless they're basically plotting some mischief against other people and planning on doing harm and, and, and hurting people and, and really just children of the devil. To put it in the, in the most simple terms, just children of the devil that are just out to do bad. Now look, this is not your average unsaved person. I don't know about you, but before I got saved, I was not just planning and plotting to just do har you know, harm to people and, and to defraud people and do all these various things. Was I a sinner? Absolutely I was a sinner, you know, just like you were. But I, I did not have this, and, and I'm not trying to make myself righteous, okay? But there's a certain type of people that the Bible talks about who are sons of Belial. These are the people that conspired and killed Jesus Christ who saw all the evidence they could possibly ask for. They saw him preaching the word of God. They saw him healing the sick. They saw him raise the dead, and they still hated him and wanted to kill him. This is the type of person we're talking about in Psalm 58. Look at verse number 3. The Bible says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming never so wisely. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. Let them melt away as waters which run continually when he bendeth his bow to shoot his arrows. Let them be as cut in pieces. As a snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away like the untimely birth of a woman, that they may not see the sun." Before your pots can feel the thorns, he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. The righteous, look at this, verse 10. The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. 
He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that a man shall say, Verily there is a reward for the righteous. Verily he is a God that judgeth in the earth. In the earth. So those are strong words there. There's no getting around that. I don't care who you are. Those are very, this is a very strong psalm. And I choose to be someone who embraces all of God's word and not make an excuse for it. So when I see this, even if this goes against maybe, you know, it's like, wow, you get taken aback. Let me read that again. Let's read it again. Look at verse number 9. Before your pots can feel the thorns, he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that a man shall say, Verily there is a reward for the righteous. Verily he is a God that judgeth in the earth. There is a very, very valid rejoicing when the wicked... Again, the wicked. I'm not talking about your average sinner. You can say, well, we're all wicked. We all have done wickedness, right? We've all sinned. We, of course we have. But the people who are, who are, you know, again, in the context, we're talking about the wicked that are, that are plotting and planning and to, to deserve even this type of ire from the psalmist. Saying, God, you know, break out their teeth. And then when, when their judgment comes... When the vengeance comes upon them, to be glad about that. To rejoice that, you know what? God is just. I mean, think about it. God promises all this wrath and all this fury and everything else. He has to be a God of His Word. And we could rejoice in the fact that God is a God of His Word. And one other point, you know, we're talking about rejoicing. One of the ways we rejoice is by singing, singing psalms, under, singing songs unto God. This is a psalm. This is, this is sung. I mean, this was meant to be sung. Right. This, is, this is a psalm. And, and all of these are, you know, all the psalms are songs. And we're sung. This is not, we, and I'll, I know this for a fact, we do not have a song like this in our hymnal. We don't. It doesn't exist. And I'm not knocking the songs we have in this song because I love them. I think they're great songs. But, it would be a little bit more accurate if we had, and look, it, this isn't, you know, you can read through the entire book of Psalms and see how many Psalms are like this, that, that kind of have this more, I, I don't want to call it negative, but, you know, that type of a connotation where things are more difficult, I guess. But how many are like this? Not that many, but there are some. And this is, this is a cause for rejoicing. And you know what? Take that home and study it. Study the whole psalm out. Read the whole thing in context. We read most of it, but, but read the whole thing and figure it out and decide, you know, is this valid? I think it is. The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the, feet in the blood of the wicked. There's going to be rejoicing in heaven when right before Jesus Christ comes back, and you've got the saints before the altar saying, How long, Lord, O oh God, does this now judge and not avenge our blood? These are saints. These are saints that don't have their flesh anymore. They're not sinning when they're going to God and asking and begging God, God, pour out your wrath on these wicked people that have killed us and slain us and persecuted us and did all this manner of evil against us. You say, the Bible says love your enemies. I know the Bible says love your enemies, and we ought to love our enemies. That's absolutely true. But there are certain enemies of God. You know what? I don't even want to get into all that because it's a whole other sermon, and um, I don't want to just get, get wrapped up in that. But these, are, these last three things are things that they may not seem, uh, they're not going to come to the top of your mind when you, when you, re, when you think about rejoicing. But we can rejoice. We can rejoice in the fact that God is a just judge. Rejoice and rejoice in the fact that, you know what, he's going to be taking a vengeance. In this psalm and in, the, in what I was referencing in Revelation of the souls that were, that were before the, uh, the throne of God, asking God to, to judge them, it's because vengeance belongs unto the Lord. He's the one that's going to repay. We don't have to worry about it. I mean, all these things that happen, you know, we don't take this stuff into our own hands. We don't go and, and have to, to right every wrong and, and even see that the wicked have this judgment poured out upon them. 
But there's nothing wrong with being satisfied or rejoicing when God does bring his vengeance and he does right the wrongs and he does just make everything the way that it ought to be. I don't know about you, but there's, I don't think there's anything wrong. You think about the people of the world, they rejoiced when uh, uh, Saddam Hussein was put to death or Osama bin Laden or Adolf Hitler or whoever, whoever your figure might be that's been demonized and, and, and you know, let's just assume rightfully that, that they, you know, they're these wicked people and they've done all this stuff to rejoice when the wicked leader or the, the, the person responsible, you know, when Jeffrey Dahmer died or John Wayne Gacy or these, you know, these, these, these weirdos and the pedophiles, up, when, when they get judgment executed against them, there's nothing wrong with rejoicing. That, the, that justice has finally been served. There's many things in this world that can cause us to grieve. There's plenty of that. We need to understand that we're in a spiritual battle. And there's definitely the need for having a sober attitude and a seriousness about church and about our lives. But let's not forget the many reasons that we do have to rejoice. And again, we'll go back to the, the more, the more uh, accepted. Rejoice in the, in the fact that if you, know, if you don't agree with the last part of what I just, what I just said, you know, study out for yourself, but don't miss the point in the sermon of having the rejoicing, having the joy, being thankful and rejoicing the things that God has done for you, recognizing the blessings that you have, recognizing being appreciative for your, for your salvation, and, and the rejoicing when the, when the souls of others get saved, and uh, just rejoicing the fact that God will protect us, He'll look over us, He's given us so much, and that we can fully trust and have confidence in Him. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for, for every single, God, I thank you for every single verse of the Bible, every line, every single passage, dear God. I thank you for all of the instruction and for all the wisdom that you've given us. Lord, I pray that you would please help us to challenge our own um, understanding and beliefs just with what your script with what the word says dear lord i don't claim to, to know everything about the bible dear god but i just have an open heart and i pray that you would please uh continue to instruct me instruct all of us here uh tonight that we can just uh, believe your word for what it says and not have to make excuses for it dear lord uh, we love you we thank you we thank you for all the blessings you've given us dear gods in jesus name we pray amen